Presenting the Shakespeare Authorship Game. I will start with the issue. The issue boils down to who was this writer. Before I continue, I will make one pertinent quote. Professor Laura Mercini Houghton said, truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Then it is strongly opposed. And finally, it becomes self-evident. For the Shakespeare authorship question, we are between stages one and two. Many believers in the Stratford story actually ridicule doubters with ad hominem attacks that border on libel and slander, if not crosses that border. Others strongly oppose doubters' claims and the evidence. And to do that, many of them are actually changing the narrative of their story to fit the facts. I hope that by the end of the decade, we get to stage three. The Shakespeare name has been associated with quartos of poems, plays, the sonnets, and the first folio for quite some time. However, since the very beginning, the man has been an enigma. The truth of the matter is, the facts of the Stratford man's biography do not fit the contents of the works. And here are the major points. First, he did not get a university education, despite the fact that most of the play material and the poems contain knowledge and information that could only have been obtained through a university level education. Second, there were no public libraries, meaning that the Stratford man could not go to his local library to get that information. Third, commoners could not socialize with the nobility except as servants or under extraordinary circumstances. That means commoners could not go to nobles libraries to check out books as if it was a library. Fourth, he never visited Italy or France. The contents of the plays set in France and Italy have geographic, cultural, and even legal information that only someone who had visited those countries could obtain. Next, all extant contemporary documents are business or legal transactions. There is nothing about him writing. None of those documents can connect him to writing in any way, shape, or form. There are no letters from him to anyone. For the best writer in the English language, this is a very big sin of omission. Where are the letters? Speaking of letters, there's only one letter to him known to exist, and it was never delivered. It was from Robert Quiney requesting from Shakespeare assistance in obtaining an 80 pound loan. He was also stingy and sued for small amounts of money owed to him even many years after the fact, despite the fact that the writer of the plays frowned upon such miserliness. He was not lame nor impoverished, unlike the writer of the sonnets. He did not leave any manuscripts, books, or writing instruments in his will. This is a point of contention and has been since day one. What writer does not have manuscripts, books, or writing instruments to leave behind to his heirs? This is the next point that I'm going to make, and it's red flag for a reason. Neither of his daughters could read or write. There is no proof of it. The only extant scrawl from Susanna is actually something that looks like a person copying a name would do. And Judith only made an X. What writer would not teach his children how to read the works he left behind? The answer is nobody. Speaking of nobody, nobody in his family called him a writer until many decades after his death. And even then, those claims are quite questionable. Also, none of his fellow townspeople called him no writer. The diaries and 
documents left behind call him a gentleman or someone of the gentry, someone who owns property. They also call him a merchant, but not a writer. In short, he is as blank as any of his known portraits. For contemporaries who knew the secret of the man, it was not a question, but a game. Where they played the game. The game began with Venus and Adonis, the very first quarto bearing the Shakespeare name. Continued on in the first edition of Lucrece. It continued on through the quartos, both anonymous and those with his name. It continued on with quartos that should have borne his name and should be part of the canon, but the orthodox scholars do not want to admit these. Contemporary writers such as Henry Peacham or Francis Mears also played the game in their books. The 1640 edition of his poems, edited by John Benson, also played the game, as well as William Marshall, the man who created the frontispiece engraving. The game was also played by more obscure writers such as Edmund Howes in the 1618 edition of Stowe's Annals of Britain. It was played by William Brown of Tavistock in his eulogy to the Countess of Pembroke after she died in 1628. It was also played by the anonymous balladeer who wrote a mournful ditty entitled Elizabeth's Loss in 1603. It was played by the people who put together the 1709 Rowe edition of the works though I don't know if Nicholas Rowe actually knew that it was being played. It was played at the Stratford Monument in Westminster. But above all, it was played in the first folio, where the editor, compositors, and printer had the best opportunity to tell people who was really behind the words on the page. What will be surprising to most viewers is that it was also played at the Stratford Monument by people who also knew the secret and wanted to tell it through puzzles and jokes. Now we get to the goal of the entire game. Well, first of all, it had to reach the widest possible audience or those people who already knew the secret so that it would be a nudge, nudge, wink, wink for everybody. It had to conform to basic principles and reveal the secret identity at the same time. The challenge was, who could put the highest number of clues, hints, or puzzles in a book without giving the true author's identity away? It was a game of chicken with the authorities for this reason. The real author's family and in-laws were the most powerful people in England, and to expose his writing, particularly if plays, was to bring shame and dishonor upon their name. Now we present the game. These eight writers were very important in the period that we are talking about, and if they wanted to produce hints and tell secrets in an easily identifiable and understandable way, the way they could do it would be through puzzles. There are six general features of puzzles. One, at no time will creators lead readers astray. Why bother putting them into a text if you're going to divert their attention away from the true solution? Two, no unique keys or ciphers are used. Three, hints how to find and solve them will be nearby. Four, they will be easy to solve according to the keep it simple stupid principle. Five, all parts are visible. Six, they should give you an idea what you're looking for through repetition. Point number two is very important because no unique keys or ciphers are used. That means 
The puzzles do not require customized or obscure codes, ciphers, or keys to solve. Most of the puzzles require only the 23-letter Latin alphabet gematria values, a smattering of Hebrew and Greek gematria, and the Latin alphabet repeated count, which I call the lark. Literate people knew these things. Puzzles could be hiding in plain sight. How they did it. In keeping with the six general features of puzzles, they followed three principal rules. We subtract smaller numbers from larger numbers. Items can be subtracted from a sum if they are different. Words and brackets can be optional. We also use typesetting tricks, spelling differences, spelling errors, numbering errors, errors of fact, errors of omission, allegorical images, and allegorical figures. Viewers have referred to my video, The Easy Peasy Way to Tell Secrets, to get more information on these methods. Why was there a secret? Introducing to you John Noble. He knew some very clever commoners, but no matter how clever these commoners were, he could not socialize with them either openly or in the presence of other nobles because of class differences. See my video setting the stage for a little bit more on that. Furthermore, there were unacceptable topics for him to publish under his name. They included poetry, fiction, satire, critiques of the church or government, drama, and I red flag that for good reason, heretical books, and magical grimoires. Drama is red flag because drama was associated with lowlifes, because in the public theaters at playhouses of the time, petty criminals frequented the, uh, the plays to ply their trade. There were some acceptable topics that some nobles actually printed under their name. They were theology, translations of the classics, military matters, history, medicine for those nobles who actually studied medicine, philosophy, and natural science, or just science. However, there were topics acceptable after you're dead, and they were generally poetry and fiction. Notice what's missing. Here's an example. On the right, we see Mary Sidney Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, who published in 1590, the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. Notice how her name, or her title rather, is in large uppercase letters. Yet, her dead brother, Sir Philip Sidney, still got the credit. This is despite evidence to show that Mary Sidney was responsible for perhaps half of the book. So even she couldn't escape the stigma about publishing under her own name. I'm going to make one last point, and it's very crucial to understand. In all of this, everything is hiding in plain sight and has been for the better part of 400 years or more. Thank you for watching. Stay safe, everybody.